Wurundji are just such an amazing, diverse and curious kingdom. I think from childhood, from crawling around in the forest, when I mean, it was all of interest, whether it was the beetles or the mosses or the orchids, but the fungi held another level of intrigue. I think my interest at first was an aesthetic one. I saw these absolutely curious and bizarre and intriguing forms. But then I wanted to know, what did they do? Trying to understand their amazing role in ecosystems, how they underpin our forests and woodlands and gardens, and that led me into the science of fungi. Fungi occupy a kingdom all of their own. For a long time they were thought to be plants, but we've known for 50 years or so now that they're not plants. They actually, they don't have chlorophyll, they don't photosynthesise, they don't have cellulose and lignin like a plant, they actually have another substance called chitin. And so we've got animals in one kingdom, plants in another, and then the fungi occupy a third kingdom. And we often call plants producers, animals consumers, but fungi are the great recyclers. So the mushroom, or what we call an agaric, that is a fungus that has those lovely lamellae or gills underneath the cap, that's what we're most familiar with, the mushroom we see in the supermarket, for example. But fungi manifest in all these other amazing configurations. So some appear as, as lattice balls, others appear as phallic-shaped clubs coming out of the earth. Then we have some that are very coralline. Then we have jellies that look like some kind of brain sitting on a log. And then we have others that are called the stinkhorns, However, that's just the tip of the iceberg. These are just the reproductive structure of the fungus, which exists as this mycelium, this amazing tapestry or network of interconnected long cells called hyphae under the soil. Here we have a fly agaric. The scientific name is Amanita muscaria. Musca is Latin for fly. And this one forms those mycorrhizal relationships with conifers. You can see the needles here. This one's actually latched onto the roots of the conifer. It's expanding out those roots, helping it access more nutrients and more water. And in return, the tree is giving the fungus a feed of sugars. So here we've got some saprobic fungi, or sometimes called saprophytic fungi. They're the recycling fungi. So we can see the fruit bodies appearing on the outside of the wood, but the actual fungal mycelium is all coursing through that wood, secreting enzymes, breaking down the lignin and the cellulose, returning that to the soil, those nutrients. Oftentimes in Australia, we like a tidy garden. We like to clean up all of the leaf litter and the fallen debris on the lawn. But in actual fact, that's the habitat of fungi. That's where the fungi live that support the plant species in the garden. So by cleaning up and removing that leaf litter, we take away the homes of those fungi and we reduce the health and resilience of the trees. So leaf litter is vitally important habitat and we need to retain it in the garden rather than always tidying it up. Look at that. Isn't that stunning? So here, because we've got this great diversity of trees and different habitats and microclimates within the garden, we run a fungus foray here at Ardahilia. So one of the important ways to identify fungi is actually to be aware of the texture. So for example, this one here has a texture almost like suede. Have a feel of that one. Feel that suede texture. Mostly I work in forests and woodlands and less often in gardens. And typically with open gardens, we look at the plants and the design of the garden. But with this foray, we actually look at the role of the fungi and the interconnections with plants and trees. And in that way, we tap into a very different audience of gardeners and horticulturalists who also like to know about the role of fungi. You can see here we've got a great array of different types of configurations of the fruit body form. For example, here we've got a bracket fungus, and this, this particular one is called the scarlet bracket, or Pycnoporus cochineus. You can see underside, if you have a look here with the magnifying glass, it's got tiny pores on the underside, let you hold it. And this particular one was used by Aboriginal people as a cure for mouth ulcers and sores in the mouth. This one is a saprobe, which means it's a recycling fungus, it grows on dead wood. In Australia, for a long time, we thought about nature or biodiversity as flora and fauna. And we forgot the third F, the fungi. And it's really only in, in recent decades, pretty much since the 1980s and the first fungus field guides came out, that we realised that fungi are part of the biodiversity equation as well. And potentially we have the oldest knowledge of fungi in the world, if you look at our Aboriginal use of fungi. But unfortunately, so much of that knowledge has been passed on orally and we don't have that chronology and recorded documentation of the history of fungi that you see in Europe. 
So humans have known about the edibility of fungi for thousands of years, but fungi are also a very important food source for a great array of other animals as well. So we know invertebrates, such as your slugs and snails, love to eat fungi, but also a great range of native Australian mammals also feed on fungi at this time of year. Mammals such as bilbies, bettongs, bandicoots and wallabies, potaroos, all rely on fungi, particularly the underground fungi, what we know as the truffles or truffle-like fungi. So in terms of our native Australian fungi, we've still got so much more to learn and I feel very passionate and very excited about learning what's out there, why they're important, why they're significant in our ecosystems and sharing that with others. Thank you.